As a matter of fact, I no longer felt welcome in Leiden. The physicists considered me as a deserter. And the mathematicians, one of whom openly prided himself on, of course, knowing nothing about computers, were just contemptuous. It was all finite, so it had to be trivial, you know. In the meantime, a pattern emerged. In the meantime, a pattern emerged for the cooperation between me and my hardware colleagues, Lopster and Scholten. After the functional specification of the next machine had been written, usually by me, that document served as a kind of contract between us. It told them what machine to design and construct, while I knew what I could count on, while writing all the basic software for the machine. The target of this division of labor was that my programs would be ready by the time the construction of the machine had been completed. Looking back now, I observe that the above arrangement has had a profound influence on how I grew up as a programmer. I found it perfectly normal to program for a not yet existing machine. As a byproduct, it, it became firmly ingrained in my mind that I programmed for the abstract machine as specified in the original document and not for the actual piece of hardware. The original document was not a description, but a prescription. And in the case of a discrepancy, not the text, but the actual hardware would be at fault. At the time I regarded this division of labor and the resulting practice of programming for non-existing machines as perfectly normal. Later I read an American article on why software was always late. I remember being very amazed when I read that limited availability of the hardware was a main cause. And I concluded that the circumstances under which I had learned programming had been less common than I had assumed. Of course, I could not exclude from my designs typographical errors and similar blemishes, but such shortcomings did not matter as the machines were not ready yet. And after the completion of the machine, they could be readily identified as soon as they manifested themselves. But last comforting thought Here we are. Was denied to me in 1957 with the introduction of the real time interrupt. Yes, those are the important things I did <laughs> in 1957. Yeah. When Lobster and Scholz suggested the real time interrupt for the, for the X1, our next machine, I got visions of my program causing irreproducible errors and I panicked. Eventually, Lobster and Scholten flattered me out of my resistance and I studied their proposal. The first thing I investigated was whether I could demonstrate that the machine state could be saved and restored in such a way that interrupted programs could be continued as if nothing had happened. I demonstrated instead that it could not be done and my friends had to change their proposal. Admittedly, the scenarios under which the original proposal would fail were very unlikely. But this can have only strengthened my conviction that I had to rely on arguments rather than on experiments. At the time, that conviction, conviction was apparently not so widespread. For up to seven years later, I would find flaws in the interrupt hardware of new commercial machines. One of them was the IBM 360. I was extremely cross 
for the blunders that you could find in, uh, the, inter in the design of the interrupt hardware of that machine, because um, one of the designers, Jerry Blau, with, uh, should have known better because I had intensely cooperated with him in the design and debugging of the Ferta in the early 50s. Okay, so that was 57. I don't remember what I did in 58. I had a very illuminating experience in uh, 1959. Um, I posed to my colleagues at the Mathematical Center uh, the following problem. Consider two programs that can communicate via atomic reads and writes in a shared store. Can they be programmed in such a way that the execution, executions of their critical sections exclude each other? in time. Uh, I made a competition out of that and solutions came pouring in but they were all wrong. So people tried more complicated solutions. Now as they made their solutions more and more complicated uh, their solutions required more and more elaborate counterexamples for their refutation and I had to give up um, and I had to change the rules. The rules became that besides the solution, they should hand in an argument why the solution was correct. 